so there's a lot of if you work in ministry you will see the waves of people go up and then people go way down and this isn't just leaders it's all of us that fall into this sad state where we get going great and focused with faith with Jesus with our purpose and then for some reason the wipeouts happen and some of them are so cataclysmic that they hurt entire communities of people they're disillusioned about God because they tie the fall of a person to the character of God or the power of God not to stop it things like that happen and it becomes a real um, tricky mess to try to explain to people because they're disillusioned by the conduct of some especially when it comes to leaders of the Christian faith so as much as this happens to everyone if you are a brand new Christian or if you are a seasoned many year Christian leader there is one choice that can send you into a tailspin that will bring you down and everyone will see it because you didn't catch yourself when it could have not been so visible and so I'm going to speak mostly addressing the leader level because that is by far the most concerning level it impacts so many but it applies to everyone because we are all leaders every single one of us is a leader saved or unsaved we're leading someone's watching us someone's looking to us for direction we are all leaders some sadly even in the faith are leading people away from Christ sadly many in the faith are leading people away from Christ into prosperity of life not prosperity of faith but of provision for bigger 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 and more so there are many on both sides saved or unsaved that are leading very poorly and there are those who lead well but this will be about how to not fall how to catch that because there's common things for all of us that precede a fall from disgrace that is visible to everyone and the one common denominator is pride of course leaning on your own understanding and that's a common theme on those who fail in very public ways doesn't matter at what level and occasionally a leader will get caught in a scandal and they'll own up to it and they'll apologize but sadly oftentimes it doesn't go like that it will be shown that they were confronted or that messages were sent to people that should have certainly taken those seriously but people didn't or they were afraid to or the leaders were untouchable and I think I saw last night on something I saw that there was a major mega church denomination global church that in the last year out of 16 campuses nine of them closed due to leaders their top leaders having scandals that had been reported on for years but nobody did anything so then when it hit it blew up it blew up nine big campuses which is a lot of people impacted so generally because of the pride they often make excuses they justify their actions they divert blame they lash out they call it righteous anger they will play with words about I did this but I didn't do this I was part of a church scandal once where the pastor's wife said he was involved in an inappropriate relationship with a female but they did not have sexual intercourse 
So people like to play with words to try to minimize how serious this actually was against the kingdom. And none of these, no response other than full transparency and full repentance is acceptable before God. Nothing but that. Our leaders are not special people. They're not better than anyone else. In fact, everything is level at the cross. So someone who would appear to be very mentally ill, homeless, owns nothing, who knows Christ is equal to someone who has um, pastored a church for 30 years, who's still walking steady in their life. He is no better than the one who has nothing and who struggles every day for sanity. It's important to remember that God is in complete control. And if somebody in a high position of leadership in the Christian community falls, they were allowed that position by God. God let them be in that position. So I know many have struggled with how did they get that job or how did they get that high? They certainly aren't. Their character doesn't match that, but God allowed it. And he will allow very abusive people into high positions because he will teach the rest of us what is abhorrent to him through that. And don't even think about doing it. And I definitely am a fruit of that. I have learned many things from that exact, um, what God allows for that. And I know that God allows that because it has completely changed the path that I'm on. In the early 1900s, churches agreed on the following principles. Biblical inspiration and the infallibility of Scripture as a result of the virgin birth of Jesus, belief that Christ's death was the atonement for sin, the bodily resurrection of Jesus, and the historical reality of the miracles of Jesus. But over time, the image of being a believer no longer even applied to those things. You don't even hear those. You might see them in a brochure about a denomination, but you sure don't hear about those. The image of what a Christian is has become more like seven steps to peace. It is all about the image of a believer and how they're, they can be bettered or blessed or um, improved upon their because of their relationship with Christ. So it becomes more of a motivational type club that you would sign on to. And image has become everything. In fact, if you sit, look at the music, the a lot of the worship songs will talk about not Christ, not exalting Christ, but I, 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 me, I, it'll come from an approach of the my feelings about me worshiping and so this turns into legalism this is now a legalistic approach and it has created generations of christians that are terrified to open up about their sins their weaknesses because it has become about behavior if you behave well, you're a good Christian. If you don't behave well, you're a bad Christian. And they be, we become masters of disguise and very good liars. And white lies, as they're called, become acceptable to cover up small sins, but also very big sins. And things grow bigger and bigger and bigger. And the cover-ups get bigger and bigger and bigger as a result. And there is no such thing as a white lie, by the way. A lie is a lie as a lie. And the Bible says all liars will be found in a lake of fire. So if you practice lying, even what you think of as white lies, you better repent of that behavior and become a person of truth. Or on Judgment Day, you will be shocked at what happens to you. Over the years, very visible leaders within this evangelical movement that I'm particularly addressing, they can preach like nobody else and everybody is applauding their sermons because of whatever kind of power they exhibit. But then these same 
people will have affairs, they will steal money from their own church, from their own people, they will have all kinds of scandals. And while some of these leaders are actually frauds, because there is a fair number of frauds in every level of life, they were never true followers of Christ from the beginning, but a lot started out with good intentions, but they gave in to their sinful nature at some point. And we can justify about anything in our own minds if we try hard enough. And you have to catch those at a thought because a thought is a baby deed. And a small fantasy in your mind becomes a porn addiction that then turns into an affair. And it's a short and very exhilarating journey that destroys your entire life, your legacy, your family, everything will go as a result of you letting a small thought take one step at a time unchecked until everything is wiped out and you will be remembered by the result of that one choice instead of all the amazing things you did previous. If you combine the sin nature with pride, and a legalistic environment which is based on conduct that is based on fear you have the perfect setup for a scandal for anyone so if you have the sin nature which we all have pride which is i think and listen to my own thoughts and obey them a legalistic environment which is based on what they do is who they are and add fear of being seen for who you are that will set up a scandal and leaders are terrified to get the help they need with their issues for that very reason because some ask that they come forward that they admit this to like a certain level of people around them and they fear the humiliation in front of their peers and the probably the lack of respect that they will get and the possible leaking of all this information and they know that there's a possibility that their lives will be destroyed so that keeps them from talking and while confessing and asking for forgiveness is biblical doing so in front of an entire church is incredibly embarrassing and destructive and that should be limited to the parties who were directly affected where appropriate so that is not always a right response Confession, James 5.16, and repentance, Luke 13.3, and making amends should be done very regularly as a part of our lives. That should be just a continuous expectation of our lives, and it should be done daily if possible. If it's done daily, you don't end up in some huge scandal because for the most part, you're keeping yourself clear of entanglements. The church should be a safe place for us to be vulnerable and to confess our struggles, not a place to be terrified of being found out. Dallas Willard says, Lord, please grant me more power. Please do not grant me more power than my character can handle. And we can also add, Lord, please do not grant me more success than my character can handle. And I also pray that my competitors are more successful than myself. That is the humility that we should be walking in. And many people go down because their character was not strong enough to handle their success. That alone was enough reason. When public figures fall, social media is like lightning. And we know that now. It's like lightning in how fast it is. It's like lightning in its destructive power. And if the failure of people causes you to drift away from God, then your faith was in people and not in God. So if you suddenly start coming out against Christianity or faith because of what someone did, you did not even have faith in God because God is equally sovereign and holy. His character is unchanged when self-proclaimed followers fail or when they're faithful. He is not changed either way, and he does allow people who are failing at obedience to fall very publicly. He will cause it himself, in fact. That not once should be held against him 
He does that in mercy to minimize victims, to straighten out the message, and to bring down heretics, people who are not even his to begin with, that are taking seats at his table. There's a reason the Bible says that teachers are to be judged more strictly than others in James 3, 1. Those who represent Christ in public leadership have immense potential for both good and evil. And younger Christians are abandoning the church at alarming rates. I've heard this for years that it's like 98% of kids that did great in youth group end up leaving the faith in their first year or two of college. It's a very high number. And there's this long narrative that when these young Christians graduate from high school, they're ill-prepared and blindsided by outspoken atheist college professors. And I have heard that too many times. And that explanation seems to shift the responsibility away from the church and it places it on the world. And it makes people nervous about state colleges because of the risk of their, their child going away to college and losing their faith. But what is left out of that equation is that in this great falling away of these young people are that the number is equally great of those attending private Christian universities where there are no atheist professors present, or at least not teaching atheism. And Lifeway did a research project on this, and they came up with the primary cause of why young people leave the faith at that age when they leave home has nothing to do with the atheist professors. It has a lot to do with the actions or the failures of those within the church or the inconsistencies within their home. And this study shows that the actions of the church are what is repelling these students or causing them to question what they've been taught because of the inconsistencies that they have been in, they simply can't buy it. And the moral failure and hypocrisy of those within the church is far more devastating to the faith of this younger generation than any arguments by atheists outside. These young people are wise enough to know that an atheist can argue all day long with them, but if they have experienced God, that does not matter. That's not going to sway them any more than it would sway me at this point because of what God has been to my life. But if you're a young person and you don't have a lot of experience with God, but you see that those around you talk all this talk about Jesus, those who you live with, but they actually don't walk this and you know they don't really believe it because they aren't it. They aren't what they say. That's very disillusioning. Those people are very close to you and it frustrates and embitters young people. They do not like the duplicity and the failure of Christian leaders or even Christian parenting may not hinder Christians of strong faith, but it does impact often in very profound ways, those who have a less stable and a newer faith. And hypocrisy in the church has been around as long as the church itself, but what has changed is social media. Social media has changed everything. And now social media can broadcast any failure, any rumor. They can spread things from here to the end of the earth in five seconds. And it has a much wider audience. Whereas in the past, Christians may have been let down by a local Christian leader or mentor. Now these failures become national news. And Christian leaders are not immune to failure. So it's very wise to pay attention to warning signs and not to be afraid to address it with your Christian leaders should they start sliding. Because when it does fall apart, people say, yeah, I kind of saw that that was possibly happening. But it's very wise to at least confront it so that they are not caught in the complete fallout going, not one person around me saw that coming either. If you did see it, at least have the courage to say something and tell them to take a very honest look at themselves. In Dr. Bobby Clinton's study of 3,500 leaders for Christ, it was found that only one third of these leaders finished well. Many drop out, usually because of burnout. 
Some have moral failing. The majority plateau. They fade into a slow fall or fail. They just slowly fall out. And in the Bible, this is also true. Out of 49 leaders featured in the Bible, only 13 of them finished well. And this is why Jesus' little brother warned us not to be too quick to step into being a spiritual leader or a spiritual teacher over others. In James 3.1, this is why Paul urged his young pastor Timothy and all of us who serve God to watch carefully over our ministry and our soul, which is the source of our ministry. 2 Timothy 4.16 There are common reasons why leaders and others fail morally and ethically, and we all need to be vigilant since most of us are seen as a leader or a mentor to someone. And here are some conditions that may set up a leader for moral failure. Some of the reasons are the same, even with the world. I'm gonna say it's very parallel, that the, the reasons are very similar. Each of us are drawn away by our own evil desires and enticed, and leaders in a church or a ministry are not exempt from that. So when people say, that this would not have happened had not this person done this, or there has to be a corresponding match on the inside of me to be pulled into a temptation brought to me by someone else. I am not tempted to do many things that other people get pulled into because I frankly don't have any desire for that. But there are things in me that I have to be very careful to not go around certain places or people because I don't want to be pulled into it. One is a lack of faith. And some over time, they don't see and trust God to be at work in all of their life situations. They have become religious, legalistic. They've gotten too big to be um, submitting to God. They just don't see God in their situations nor do they really want him in their situations. Two, lack of vision. Many sadly don't act on God's call because instead they try to grow themselves due to being drawn personally to a role they aren't even called to by God. And the ministry should create vision and adhere to it. If a leader doesn't have a vision, they can still be a leader, but they will not succeed in any eternal mission. So many look at the wealth or the power, the authority, the something that they see in someone's life and they go and try to be that role because they want that thing. It has nothing to do with Jesus or the harvest. It has everything to do with, I like how that felt. I like how that looks. I'm going to go do that. God did not call them and he will not be behind it. But the devil may power them. He may give them exactly what they want, which is power and authority and wealth because he knows they're a fraud and he would love to exalt them because he knows they're not kingdom building at all. They're actually building the kingdom of darkness. They're causing people to want more money, more, um, more, 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 more for this life, no mention of the next. Three, lack of ethics. Our Christian leaders are still held to a higher standard by the word of God, plain and simple. If you have put yourself out there as a leader, you're held to a higher standard. And it depends upon two qualities. What they do, which is competency, and who they are, which is character. And leaders must have integrity and moral ethics. And they should be easily able to lead by example and stick to that higher standard that is expected of them by God. If he called them there, then he is going to make sure they have that. And there should be no conflict between how they live and what they believe in and what they teach. It should all look exactly the same. For a lack of self-care, if a leader doesn't take care of themselves, no one else will. Leading is very invigorating, but it's also very exhausting. And like anyone, Christian leaders often feel drained, depressed, and demotivated because it is often thankless. And those who ne neglect their physical, psychological, emotional, or spiritual needs are going to find disaster. So you have to have fun 
written into your life because otherwise you're going to crash and burn. Five, lack of accountability. Accountability by itself does not work. You have to ask others to hold you accountable and your heart must be focused on honoring the word of God. Both things are, are required. It's healthy to say to those we trust, I'm struggling in this area, can you pray with me and ask the hard questions from time to time? And leaders must be humble and courageous enough to reach out when they need someone else's help. That is hard for most leaders to do. Six, lack of flexibility. Leaders are sometimes seen as strong-willed people and can be stubborn about the wrong things. They're controlling, they micromanage. It's common that this they want it done right. No one else is gonna get it right, so we're just gonna do it all ourselves. Good leaders know how to compromise well. They listen to others. They make choices based on the best available options. They also know when the decision they've made is terrible and can quickly admit it and make a different decision that is not terrible. Seven, lack of humility. Leaders tend to get power hungry and they forget where they came from. This is not just leaders, this is anyone. And this causes some to act as if their position of leadership is secure regardless of their performance. They treat the organization as a means to an end. It's all about them because they feel they deserve special treatment and the ministry belongs to them personally. If they built it, they take personal ownership for it. They feel that this is theirs. And so I've seen this many times where someone has built a ministry, they have fallen into sin, they have fallen, their character is very poor, but they claim that ministry as their own personal property and you can't put them out because they refuse to leave it. It's, they feel it's theirs. If it's theirs, it's not God's. If it's someone's personal property, a ministry does not belong to God. That should be a red flare. If they're struggling and they are not living up to the expectations that God has for a leader, yet they claim their rightful place as they see it, that is a huge red flag. This is a bullseye of leadership failure, pride a bullseye right there. You're not going to root out pride in one day. It's going to take a lifetime of patient, prayerful dependence upon God to defeat pride and practice humble leadership. And only God can help you do this. But when you sin or you set an example that is against what God would want for a leader, you need to step out until God puts you back. This is never about um, restoration or redemption or it isn't about the leader at all and people will get this mixed up when they start focusing on the leader and how long should we um, set them down what should the requirements be for them to get back into ministry the problem is it was never about them if it was correctly done it is about the gospel it is about Jesus Christ it is about the Word of God it is not about a person so if they have tarnished and hurt the gospel of Jesus Christ, set them out. It is not about anything about their life at all. It is simply bring someone in that stands for and adheres to the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the standard. Eight is a lack of communication. When a leader already lacks focus and vision, this typically breaks down the communication. And then when arguments arise, they blame their people for their poor effort, their lack of commitment, and they don't recognize it as their own poor communication with their people. They just blame their people and they take no ownership of this. Nine, they do not have a close mentor. Leaders who rise to the level of expect expectancy of their mentor, so if they don't have one, there won't be a level. There's no bar set for them. They will rise according to their own best thinking. And they don't have a caring and wise guide. So they will not rise high or they will not rise high in the right way or the right focus. They will rise high to something else. Everyone 
should have a wise guide or a mentor, every single person. 10, some stop learning. Plateaued leaders neglect to develop or improve by reflecting on experiences, getting feedback from others, honest feedback, reading. There comes a point in time where they feel that this is their oyster and they know what they need to know and they're just gonna keep rolling around in that same message. They don't grow past, even though that is never the way of God. He would always want us moving deeper and deeper and deeper into knowing him and leading others there also. 11, choosing isolation over community. Sin happens in secret. Almost always sin starts in the secret. And the only way to keep secrets is to remove yourself from true community. And isolation can be a very natural drift of those who are leading. But loneliness and isolation are not inevitable. They are choices. So when someone ends up there and they talk about how lonely they are or how isolated they are, those are choices. They're always choices. I have to make sure someone in my life knows what's going on. And that's why there's a few people around me generally that just have freedom to say things. And just because not everybody needs to know what's going on, somebody needs to know what's going on. Tatiana, she can log into every single part of my life. I don't, I think there's probably more parts to log into than I'm even aware of. But all the texting accounts, social media apps, my husband and her both have my location at all times on their phones. I looked at his phone the other day for him to make sure he was able to see it. And I see that he also has Tati's locator on his phone. So he can know where both of us are at any given time. And there's times that we've had someone we're caring for, lo their locator is on our phone and then we can't find them. And then we can look and we can even see the building they're in and we can see them like it, it was a motel once. We could see them walking back and forth as we're blowing up their phone. We could see them moving around in their room. That's how sensitive these locators are. We couldn't see which floor, but we knew exactly which room in the building. We just didn't know which floor. Solitude is a gift from God, but isolation is a tool of the enemy. And when someone's seeking isolation, there's a reason. I don't always know the reason, but there's a reason. 12, when you stop confessing your sins, we must confess our sins before God daily. And when we confess our sins, we not only need to confess what's obvious, but cracks are also good to confess because if we confess a crack, it doesn't become a crater. And for small sins, that's pretty critical because they'll grow bigger if they're not confessed. For motives that are not pure, for thoughts that are prone to dangerous directions, bring it to God right away. Confession is designed to stop sin before it starts. 13, when we're not thinking of the consequences when we are contemplating sin. And when we sin, we desire the action, but not the consequences. But sin always has consequences and oftentimes horrible consequences for people who didn't choose to sin. They're suffering because of our choice to sin. And keeping the consequences in mind can save an entire life, a ministry, and even a family. I think of every time, and I did this for years, and I'm so fortunate that I did not have an accident driving intoxicated because I had no idea. I'd lose weeks at a time of remembering anything, but I'd be out driving around. And I am so fortunate that I did not take people's lives because many people are not as fortunate as me. They wake up in jail. I've talked to them before and they don't even know why they're there. They don't know why they're there, 
until an attorney or someone comes to see them and tells them they took a life. I was um, at someone's bedside once when they had had a suicide attempt and they have a person sitting next to them always when there's been a suicide attempt. And when they woke up, they saw the person sitting next to them in a dark blue scrub outfit and they were terrified. And they looked at me and said, please tell me I did not kill someone. And it just sent chills down me because they thought that blue that they saw was police and they thought they had killed someone. I'm really happy they hadn't killed someone because some people wake up to that. Many people do. I would not want to betray the trust of people I love the most and many who really have trusted that this can be done, that you can walk out faith in Jesus Christ without moral failures, without falling into repeated using behaviors of drugs and alcohol, of which I all of those things were part of my history. I'm not better than others, but I am more desperate than others. I never want to shame Jesus again. I do not want to go out saying how amazing Jesus is and then turn around and stab him in the back again. So thinking about the consequences of a choice is a great way to ultimately avoid committing a sin because one thing is guaranteed, there will be consequences. If not here, it will come on Judgment Day and then it's too late for you to repent. 14, many times people will get high enough and aloof enough that they think the rules don't apply to them. And this is likely why many leaders fall more frequently than other levels of people because they begin to think the rules don't apply to them or that the rules shouldn't apply to them. This is incredibly dangerous thinking. Leaders who avoid accountability still eventually have to give account for their actions to God for sure. And when they get caught or when they face God on Judgment Day, they still will have to account for their actions. At the beginning of my Christian life, I was arrested the night before, the night before I was born again and had been taken to jail and then released from jail because of the condition I was in to be taken to a hospital. But I ended up on probation as a result of that arrest. And probation comes with this long list of what is expected of you and the things that you cannot do. And because I was incredibly intoxicated and high that night, I had a list that involved, I cannot go or be where those things are. And so I always thought if I just live according to this list, because there wasn't a lot of people like me at that time around where I was that were like from this lifestyle, getting radically saved, I thought this is the list I'm gonna use to go by to govern my behavior to make sure that I don't end up back in jail. Because the judge said, if you come back here, you're gonna go to jail. And so I never went back in front of the judge because I took the list of probation requirements very seriously. And I tell people, if you take that list seriously, what was handed to you when you were given probation and you live according to that list, you won't go back to jail for any reason. You probably won't go back to jail because that list is for a reason. And those of us who are serious, take it seriously. Those who don't, find ways to get around their list 
they end up going back and back and back to jail because they have no desire to live a different way. 15, trying to please everyone is a recipe for disaster for anyone at any level and trying to pander to everyone's preferences. There is no way ever to have peace or to survive when you're paranoid all the time about what your coworkers, your clients, your colleagues, your spouse, your pastor, your neighbor think about you. You are doomed for any quality, good quality of life. You are going to be paranoid, living in fear and paranoia because we always imagine the worst. People really don't think about us that much. Focus on pleasing God alone and let the consequences and the blessings fall. Just live for an audience of one. The rest may or may not like you, but they already may or may not like you. Don't try to please someone that already doesn't like you. Don't hype yourself, exaggerating and taking credit for someone else's work to make yourself look better is simply wrong. It's theft. We can also substitute God's work for our own self-image and sense of worth, and that is even more wrong and much worse theft. So if you think anything God has done to lift you up, exalt you, and make you look good, which in my life, that's everything, my very sobriety, my very sanity, if there is any, any clear thinking is a result of what God did, and I do not once take credit for it. I know for sure that everything about me that looks somewhat decent is because of him. The future of the church is in how it engages and creates an alternative kingdom culture, and that is how we think and how we see the world and life. So if you're not engaged in creating an opposing culture to what the world is, you're completely missing the point of being here for Jesus. And when we begin to oversell and promote ourselves, and we make this work about ourselves, and we start putting our name out, the name of our ministry out, the, the uh, videos of what we do, of success beyond the power of what Jesus Christ can do when we are exalting our own ministry and self more than we are showing Jesus and what he can do by the power of his Holy Spirit, our love has switched. If we are self-promoting more than promoting Jesus, we are now an idolater instead of a Christian, which is a very serious flaw to make that needs to be corrected before you meet Jesus. Being filled with jealousy over someone else and gossiping is not just a character issue, it's a theological issue in the ministry. And some leaders refuse to confront issues. They live in fear, they tolerate sin, rebellion, negativity, because they fear the impact of people leaving if they confront it. People are jealous of sizes of ministries, they're jealous of certain people they have in their ministries. If somebody gets a celebrity, then everybody else is wishing that person were at their church. You cannot build God's work on a sinful and negative foundation. It's going to hurt you in the immediate future. Make the hard decision, do the right thing, and build on a right foundation, which is bless and honor and focus only on Jesus and the kingdom to come. It may hurt you in the immediate future, but it's the right thing to do. So use diplomacy, tact, and respect, and confront those who are in your midst, in the church. Do not tolerate sin. Do not tolerate rebellion. Do not tolerate toxic negativity. Many leading ministries quit because they simply don't want to deal with the fight that's in front of them. But real leaders, will step up and face it because it's the kingdom of darkness in your midst and everyone needs it handled. And when handled properly, the church will propel forward. So any losses you face, 
You bless God, you please God, he will propel you forward. Confronting our fear doesn't just change the situation, it'll change us as well. And we need to understand that we are here to please God, not to please people, especially not people who are not pleasing God. Don't do it. Beware of what is being tolerated around you. If you are in any kind of a ministry, do not tolerate sin. Call it what it is. Make sure everyone knows it. Do not ever be caught on the side of tolerating sin, not addressing sin. Many say, well, we don't talk about that here. That is choosing to please the side of darkness, the enemy, over serving God. Every choice we make serves one kingdom or the other when we're in service for God. If you choose to protect sin at any level, you're a missionary for Satan. No other way around it. This isn't about a good kind of tolerance ever. It's a bad kind of tolerance ever when it's about sin inside of the family of God, the church, a ministry, an organization that reports as being Christian. You cannot make room for, tolerate, or befriend sin in any way. There is a church or Christian culture of following God that isn't healthy. And leadership in the church does not mean king, but it means servant. It also doesn't focus on money. It doesn't treat some as special, and it is not inconsistent. And these things, when ignored, will lead to a massive failure in the future because it disillusions people. It makes people not want this. They can't see God clearly. They think he's that way. Don't do it. Do not tolerate any of these things. Purity of the heart and motives in the kingdom of God are everything. And this is why all leaders need people to hold them accountable, who love them. And these cannot be yes people. Strip your board of yes people and make sure this is true of your leaders, that they are also not submitting to yes people. If I've seen big falls, it has been because of that very fact that they have surrounded themselves with a board or leaders around them who don't challenge them when they're making um, ag against the kingdom decisions. They've surrounded themselves with people that will let them do what they want to do. You can always look at a leader's fall and then look at the circle that he has put around himself and you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. One of the problems with the well-intentioned goals of those who want to lead people to Christ and, a sh and shepherd a flock is that they come to a place where they adopt a secular rather than a biblical leadership model. It's easy to come to the place when it's happening everywhere. I live in a city, so I know exactly how common this is. They measure success by the size of their facility, the number of seats filled in their facility, and the amount of tithing. And that, sadly, when you see those um, people talking about how many campuses, how big these campuses are, but there's hardly any missionaries out here in the field. You gotta wonder what's happening because we put out requests begging for people to come down and help us be ambassadors for Christ in the city and you can't find anyone. But yet there's thousands of people attending churches that claim success at what I don't know. They're not out trying to help turn our city around. Leaders in God's kingdom need to measure success by a completely different set of metrics. They need to be content ministering to a mustard seed size of a church. Very happy with that size, where the number of those attending is limited by those who have chosen the narrow road and those whose financial status is measured in what they were able to give. And sometimes it's two mites. Yet they're still honored like the person who would bring in a million dollar check. They are seen as just as priceless. The success of a church should be determined by the number of poor 
that attend the church and not those who completely fixate on financial prosperity. It should be determined by the number of prodigals and not the powerful, the contrite and not the comfortable. A flock that can only be successfully shepherded by a servant and not a CEO. Jesus clearly distinguished how leaders in the city of God should differ from those in the city of man. But Jesus called them to him and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their great one exercises authority over them. It shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant and whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Even as the son of man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Matthew 20, 25 through 28. Anyone who goes into ministry needs to think very carefully about how they plan to build up the church because the pathway to citizenship in God's kingdom begins at the cross. And that's where we meet a suffering, crucified Savior and not a CEO. Jesus said he came to serve, not to be served. And the world tries to tell us that power and authority gets us in the front door. But Jesus made it very clear that we enter in through the servant's quarters. Those are the true leaders. We need to remember that the higher we build that ministerial pedestal, the farther we're going to fall, either now if God is merciful or when it's too late. So maybe we need to rewrite descriptions for people that come into ministry and make sure that they know how to serve and that they have a long history of serving those who had absolutely nothing to give them back. Do not position people who have silver tongues in high positions do not do it because you will be taken adrift it will end up being somewhere it'll end up somewhere where it no longer blesses god if we lead by building ourselves up we miss we miss everything we miss allowing ourselves to be emptied out and for jesus christ and the holy spirit to be shown strong and powerful we should be known by what we have surrendered for others and not what we have acquired for ourselves. And it's very difficult to abuse the power of a servant. The bar has been set high for Christian leaders because it's a perilous business to save drowning souls when you have a millstone tied around your neck. The way we approach these failures makes a difference. And here's five ways Christians should respond when their leaders fail. Examine and ourselves don't allow our words or actions to give anyone cause to question the God that we serve have honest conversations don't dismiss another's disillusionment by saying if you had faith in God as strong as ours and the sinful deeds of this man or woman wouldn't impact you rather walk with people and guide them to that level of faith Hold leaders accountable. All Christians should be held accountable. All people should be held accountable. But the unique position of leaders amplifies their influence on the wider culture's view of Christianity. Hold them accountable. If they aren't willing to be held accountable, even in the minor details, if they are refusing to let someone have access to every level of their phone, they're not, they should not be in leadership. Call the failure sin, not exceptions. Sin is not a disease. It is sin. It is offending God, and don't call it anything else. Don't be too <clears throat> hasty to declare that people aren't true Christians either. Excluding anyone who fails more may outwardly seem to safeguard the image of the church, but the younger generation, they're not impressed with all the PR and all of the gyrations that go on. Follow a Christian example of this and set this up so that there isn't a complete loss of hope amongst that younger or newer generation of Christians. Sinful human nature is the rule, not the exception. And when a Christian sins, call it sin and then set that person up for, re for a restoration somehow don't make it look like one and done you're out and they cast get cast to the wolves that happens in many cases 
Of course, if they're unsafe and they have been sexually predatory, by all means, put them out. If someone is sinning sexually inside the leadership, they should be put out. They should be taught not to do that. They should come around. I'm not talking the congregation, but in the leadership team, that is a, that is a reason to put them out. But otherwise, show people how to be restored. Pray for those in leadership. Christian leaders may still fail, but that should not stop us from praying for them. Oftentimes, there's a destroyed family in the mix, too. And let's not be quick to condemn because all of us are one choice away from a very, very bad decision. But pray and build up people who have failed. There's six traits of leaders who do finish well. And Soul Shepherding Institute has developed this list, which gives healthy and effective leaders the way to succeed in Christ. One, cultivate intimacy with Jesus. Being fully devoted to Jesus and submitted to God's kingdom is a source of great leadership. If you wait and listen to him, you won't go wrong. Two, articulate and live by a God-appointed mission and values. So if you aren't even sure what the mission is, just live obedient to the word. To lead well in ministry, we need to discern God's call for how we can serve other people in Jesus' name. Serving is God's mission for everyone. Three, form a close relationship with a mentor. You cannot take care of yourself by yourself because you are a sick pond within yourself. You need someone you turn to for listening, pastoring, and counseling, and it's not enough to say, I read books, listen to podcasts, and go to conferences absolutely not what it means all of us in any ministry role or leadership in any way need a shepherd person in our life four keep learning study the word books anything on learning um, how to grow spiritually and how to lead well reflect on your life and how you lead ask for feedback have talks with friends and mentors seek always to have greater empathy five manifest christ likeness which is the fruit of the spirit and you can look that up and see exactly what those are in your relationships and service make sure that the fruits of the spirit are what people know you for be patient and be kind jesus will have a more positive impact on people you lead and care for than anything else you say or do Six, believe that God is going to do something special through you. Great leaders in the way of Christ have a sense of unique God-given purpose. They're not jealous of other leaders or other ministries. They're not competing. They appreciate and enjoy the position that they have. So all of us, especially leaders, but all of us, need to leave a legacy of changed lives for Christ for eternity we need to have fruitful models of ministry and good works at last. We need to not be focused on our legacy as much as we're focused on loving God and the people around us with the resources that God has entrusted to us to lead with. Precious Lord, this is a leading is never easy but it is a great 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 and high call to be um, set out in front of other christians especially thank you for every single lesson that you have taught me some i've learned the hard way but thank you for every lesson Thank you for every minute of mercy you have granted me, which is so many. Thank you for believing in me when there really is no reason to do that. And thank you for giving me the very capacity to love you and be devoted to you, which I know is not within me. So I ask that you will raise up leaders from places where no one can see them coming from, that you will raise up a strong, strong army that will go out into these dark places where no one else wants to go 
and pull out the ones who, where so many are called, who end up lost in the darkness. I pray that you would give us more people to go out there and pull them back into safety and pull them up into the calling that you brought them to this earth for. I pray that you help us. Please help us, God, in every way that you know we need help, which is so many right now. I ask that we thank you that you see us and that you are, we know that you are guiding us and guarding us. So I ask that you would, by the power of your spirit, birth revival soon in our midst. In Jesus' name, amen.